Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. So today's story is about Anthony Casamento, and he was an Italian American who was also a Marine, and he served in World War II. His heroic acts during the Guadalcanal battle saved numerous lives. And my special guest host today is my husband, Jared, again. Hi, sweetie. Hi, love. How's it going? Really good. Yeah, it's cool that you got this going. Uh, you know, I was in the Marines myself, so yeah, uh, I remember being told this story when I went through boot camp, you know, because part of getting through boot camp is you got to learn about Marine history. The history. So, but it was cool that you're doing this. I mean... It's been a long time since I'm kind of remembering some of the details on this. Oh, so, for sure. Yeah, this would be cool. Yeah, thanks for recording with me today. I was in the middle of doing um, a script called The Italian Banditi, which will be the next episode. And then I realized Veterans Day is just around the corner. So yeah. I was like, put the brakes on. we got to switch gears here. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Yeah, and I had never heard of this guy before, um, but quite the story. So For sure. Yeah, all right. Well, let's get on into it. All right. Anthony Casamento, he was born on November 16th, 1920 in New York City, and he was the second child of Charles and Catherine Casamento, and Charles was born in Italy in 1894 and came to America with his family in 1900 when he was six years old. And Anthony's mom, Catherine, she was born in New York City in 1901, and her maiden name was Briamonte. Charles and Catherine, they married on December 22nd, 1918 in New York. And they would go on to have four children. And like I said, Anthony was the second born. And Anthony's older brother, Rosario, was also a veteran. Um, he was in the army and served in World War II. And he had, I bet, if I bet you a million dollars, you would probably never guess his middle name, Rosario's. Rosario Butch. Rosario Riley. Oh, <laughs> so he had a, uh, like a, like kind of like a Scottish, Irish, Irish yeah, Riley. Yeah. yeah. That's I, cool. It's kind of cool. Um, maybe, maybe, uh, one of his parents had a good friend mm-hmm. that was maybe Scottish or Irish. Yep, or, exactly. Or yeah, exactly. Maybe they just thought it was a cool name. They just thought it was a cool name. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and so it kind of Anthony's early years, I couldn't really find a whole lot on him. Um, but I did find that after he, you know, kind of graduated high school and all of that, uh, he worked at the Mount Sinai, Sinai, I don't know if I say that right. Um, hospital as a medical, medical clerk for the child welfare league. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but with the outbreak of world war two, Anthony, he did join the U S Marine Corps on August 19th, 1940, when he was 19. And so he went to boot camp at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in Paris Island in South Carolina. And he was assigned to the 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. That's a lot of words right there. (laughs) Yeah, so he had the main thing you hear about is uh, the Marines have to deal with, uh, when they go out there, there's a lot of sand fleas. In South Carolina? Yeah, and I guess they're real pain. Oh. Yeah, they burn and itch your skin really bad when you're training out in the field. Because so. do they do a lot of work, like, on the beach for... Oh, just, you know, when you're going, especially if you're in the infantry, yeah. you're out there in the wilderness, you're living in a, a foxhole. Yeah. You know, so you're you're going to be out there with the elements, the That's bugs, true. the nature, all that type of stuff. Yeah. So. Sand fleas does not sound Sand fun. Sand fleas, they're also called chiggers with a C H I chigger. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mom and I talked about that before because um, when, you know, my dad was born in Oklahoma and when we go back to visit, like, mom was born and raised in Denver, so she didn't know what chiggers were. Yeah. But uh, her uh, sister in law, when she went to put me down on the floor, was like, oh no, don't put her down on the floor. The chiggers will get her. Mm. <laughs> and mom was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so. A good call right there. Yeah, that could be bad. Yeah. So. And Anthony's division was deployed to the Southwest Pacific six months after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And Anthony was involved in the Battle of Guadalcanal. And this was also codenamed Operation Watchtower. And this was fought between August 7th, 1942 and February 9th, 1943. And this was obviously like on or around the island of Guadalcanal. And this was the Pacific Theater also, so. And so on November 1st, 1942, while serving as a leader of a machine gun squad in an attack on the Japanese, Anthony and the other Marines came under heavy enemy fire near the Madanqua River, and uh, they were defending a strategic airstrip, which kind of makes sense now that I think about it. That's why they probably codenamed it Watchtower. Um, and they noticed two Japanese squads were there. So Anthony, he, he was a squad leader and he sent for reinforcements, but they couldn't get there right away. And so Anthony and 29 other Marines, they just continued to fight. 
And during the battle, all members of the unit were either killed or severely wounded. And in the first initial phase of the attack, the Japanese pretty much took all of the Marines down. In fact, Anthony's squad leader, who was also his close friend, actually died in Anthony's arms. And the story goes that Anthony said a prayer for him and then laid him on the ground so he could continue fighting. Yeah, I know. It's like, there's going to be a few spots in here. I'm going to have to try not to cry. (laughs) Because even when I was like researching and writing, I would tear up. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a hard podcast to get through. Yeah. This is intense fighting, you know? It is. Yeah. And so after that, Anthony, he jumped on one of the machine guns and started firing. He later told a reporter, quote, hell, I was mad then. I didn't give a damn. I lost my head, I guess. All my friends were shot and I was out to take revenge. I, I mean, I can't even imagine what he saw because the majority of them were already shot, so. Sure, yeah, I That's mean, you're, you're in the thick of it, so it's not like you're in a spot where you're, you can have time to think through situations. It's fight or, it's fight or flight, right? That's true. So, sympathetic, parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system. And Anthony was a fighter. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like he went full, full red at that point, so. Exactly. Yep. In fact, other Marines uh, who were interviewed after the battle said that Casamento finally started crawling toward the machine gun nest, shouting at the Japanese and cursing them, daring them to come after him. Then he collapsed. And so, I mean, he just, he did not stop. (laughs) Um, And Anthony had, he... He took 14, he had 14 wounds. And so some of them were gun and some of them were shrapnel. And so he had actually got hit in the neck and it went like full through his neck. The bullet did. Um, And he knew he was bleeding really badly. So he took off his shirt and tied it around his throat to hopefully stop the bleeding. I mean, holy smokes. Yeah. Um, And I saw, I read somewhere where he, he thought that that wound was fatal um, but he just wanted to stop the bleeding as much as he could just to get a little bit of firing off. So, mm-hmm. um, and then in fact, in 1943, he gave an interview just a few months after the battle where he told a reporter, quote, I was getting pretty weak. So I took off what was left of my shirt and tied it around my throat to keep from bleeding to death. And then I poured water on my face and drank some so I could stay conscious. As long as I was conscious and could keep moving, the Japanese were afraid of my gun and wouldn't advance. And just alone that phrase of what was left of my shirt. I, that tells you how bad the situation was there. Yep, he was just doing whatever he could to hang on. So exactly. Yep. Um, and so when the ammunition on Anthony's machine gun ran out, the Japanese they started throwing grenades at him, and one of the grenades shattered Anthony's right hand. And so, despite his own mul- multiple wounds, Anthony continued to provide supporting fire and heroically held the enemy at bay uh, until he was basically just physically unable to. He later told a reporter in an interview that, quote, I knew if I gave up my position, our companies on either side of me would be slaughtered. I was on the hill. If the Japanese captured it, they could attack those below on the flank I had to hold. Yeah. So, he, he gave it his all. He did. <laughs> he gave it his all, paid off. And so. Yep. Um, and so at one point he was knocked off the machine gun, but he got back on it and continued firing. And when reinforcements arrived, they said that they found Anthony slumped over the machine gun. So he literally gave it all until he couldn't. Um, and later on, Anthony, he would recall thinking how close it was to Christmas. So like during this last umph that he had, because this battle happened in November of 1942. So he said that he was thinking about his parents and Christmas and he didn't think he was going to make it make it back and it broke his heart thinking that his parents would hear of his death so close to Christmas. Mm. So it's a tearjerker. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, those last moments he's thinking of his family. Sure. Yeah. I can. Yeah. I I mean, obviously this was, he was in a dire position right here. So for sure. I mean, he was kind of the only one left standing at that point. Really at the end of the day, that's really all that matters is your family and your friends. It's true. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Um, and so Anthony, he was later treated at a medical aid, aid station and then shipped back to the United States and admitted to the Naval Hospital a hospital in Oakland, California. But there were other Marines that survived. There was only three Marines, and that included Anthony, out of the 30. So I know that's a, a lot of casualties there. And so Anthony, like I said earlier, he sustained more than a dozen wounds, 14 to be exact. And the wounds were from machine guns and grenade shrapnel. And the wounds were to his throat, ear, torso, temple, leg, hips, and shoulders. 
And so all of these wounds would leave him permanently disabled for the rest of his life. And he was partially paralyzed and would need a wheelchair or cane to walk for the rest of his life. And actually, I read somewhere, uh, one of the newspaper articles I pulled, it actually took him four years to be able to walk again, um, even with a cane or a crutch. So, yeah, it was pretty bad. And so Anthony, he was discharged from the military on October 30th, 1944. And he was given the Purple Heart for being wounded in action, but was denied any other medals or recognition because the Navy said that there were no eyewitnesses to verify his story. However, if you, you know, we just talked about there was actually three Marines that survived the battle. And in that interview from 1943, there were other Marines who discussed what Anthony did. But all of this, so just remember that, because all of this will come into play later. Yeah, <laughs> so. now we're starting to kind of get into the... The wonderful politics exactly. that surround this type of stuff. So. Yeah, and that, so he fought a whole other battle later on in his life with politics. So, um, But after he was discharged from the military, he moved back to New York, and he was living at the YMCA where he could use the gym and the pool for rehabilitation. So, Good old uh, YMCA, baby. Good old y- hey, we just talked about YMCA last week with Claudio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, great organization. Mm-hmm. You know? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And so in 1947, Anthony married Leona Ruth Ridgway in New Jersey, and the, <laughs> their wedding got off to a little bit of a rocky start. They were getting married at a church in Camden, New Jersey, when right before the wedding was to start, the church caught fire. And so apparently the fire started in the basement kitchen. And so (laughs) poor Anthony, Leona, and the minister, they grabbed buckets and formed what was called like a bucket brigade (laughs) to put the fire out. (laughs) Sure. And after the fire was out, they had their wedding. So That's awesome. (laughs) I know. (laughs) That was nothing for him. Yeah, exactly. He was probably like, yeah. He was like, yeah, probably organized the whole thing <laughs> he probably <Yeah>. did <laughs> he probably called it the bucket brigade and yeah. <laughs> told everybody what to do <laughs> oh, um, so it started in the old kitchen huh yep in the basement darn that's probably where they were cooking the dinner for like the reception later <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah. a lot of italians back in the day always had their kitchens they had another kitchen in the basement i mean i know this is a church but (laughs) um so in the 1950 census it has anthony and his wife leona living in queens new york and um he was listed as disabled and unable to work and so anthony's um mother Catherine, she passed away on september 4th 1963 at the age of 62 and three years later his father charles passed away at the age of 72 And I'm sure that they were grateful for every Christmas that Anthony was home. Mm. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, after what he went through. For sure. And I'm sure Anthony was grateful to be home every Christmas that he could. Cherish those Christmases. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a really cool photo that I'll post on the Instagram page where he had just come home. Like, he had just got discharged and he was still in one of his Marine, like, the brown Marine uniform. Mm. Um brown so i mean this might was have been black in, and white picture, picture yeah it might so. have been in his deltas maybe okay because the alphas are have a green coat okay and then you have the brown undershirt and so. that's what this one was like a brown undershirt did he have a did he have a suit coat on he didn't okay have a so suit yeah coat he was on. probably like in his deltas okay then, yeah. all right and he's sitting on a couch with his parents and they just look so happy to have him home oh yeah <laughs> so um, but unfortunately, Anthony and Leona's marriage, it didn't last long, and they actually divorced in 1952. So they must have been separated uh, at some point, because in 1951, Anthony met his future wife, Olivia Medell. Well, that was a 19... So a year before they divorced. A so year before they divorced. it sounds like part of their divorce was he found this other lady. Yeah. Or maybe so, they were already separated and going through the divorce. Could be. And then he met yeah. Olivia during that time. Well, this is at a banjo concert. <laughs> So, dang. <laughs> they did. They met at a, at a banjo concert in Central Park. That banjo music going, man. Who knows what could happen? <laughs> it's hard to resist that banjo music. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a romantic appeal, I guess. <laughs> yep. So apparently, Anthony, he sat next to Olivia at the concert, and that's how they first met. Uh, they were both there alone. And Olivia, she was actually had just gotten a divorce, too. Maybe it was like a banjo concert for singles. That's what it turned into <laughs> <what> it <laughs> mixer. A <laughs> banjo mixer. <laughs> um, and so Olivia said that it was a really hot day, uh, the day that they met, but she was really enjoying the concert and she started singing along to 
the banjo music. <laughs> and Anthony told her that she had a nice voice. And from that point on, they spent the rest of the concert talking and just enjoying each other's company. So that's kind of a cute little story. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, and so they enjoyed each other's company so much that in 1954, Olivia and Anthony married at the City Hall in Manhattan. And they would go on to have four daughters together, Jane, Anne, Mary, and Catherine. And Anthony said that at times it was hard because they were raising the four girls on just his pension. And, you know, he wasn't able to work. I saw in one paper that his monthly pension was 963. And that was in 1978. So in today's money, that's about 4,000. But you got to think that's supporting six people. That's, yeah. Doesn't go very far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wife, four kids. That'd be a little tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't so. sound like Olivia... Olivia worked, yeah. so which that's pretty common. At it that was pretty time. common at that time. Most women stayed home with the kids. And... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But after the service, Anthony felt that he deserved the Medal of Honor, and even his old officers in the Marine Corps would told him that he deserved it and needed to pursue it. So Anthony basically started a whole new battle that would last for over two decades, trying to get the Medal of Honor. Um, and so, unfortunately, Anthony was turned down for the medal because. I think we talked about this earlier. There were no eyewitnesses to corroborate his story. But uh, like I said, there were those three, there's three Marines, including Anthony, that survived the battle. And so the other two surviving Marines, uh, they ended up reading about Anthony's fight to receive recognition and to get the Medal of Honor in a newspaper. And so they actually came forward to tell their stories and basically corroborate his story and say, hey, no, I like I saw him do this. This is this is a real story. And in fact, I even read in the Boston Herald that a Japanese officer who led the charge against Anthony and the Marines came forward to testify on Anthony's behalf. Hmm. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I couldn't find it anywhere else but in the Boston Herald. So kind of kind of an interesting fact. And so pretty large newspaper though, Boston Herald. Exactly. So yeah, that'd be I mean, obviously, you know, to have a, a former enemy combatant come forward. You know, that doesn't surprise me, though, with the Japanese, though, because they really uh, value honor. Yes. Like, through their code of Bushido mm -hmm. and, like, the samurai and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so the fighting was done, and, yeah, that that be that would be really interesting to figure out if that was true, though. Like you so, said, they, they do value honor. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, we're talking 20 years past that battle, so, you know, yeah. he can probably reflect on it and see the honor that Anthony showed that day, so... Mm -hmm. And so one of the Marines that came forward was Michael Cavarelli, and he was living in Florida at the time, but he signed a sworn statement, and he also had his statement tape recorded. And in his statement, he said he believes that Anthony saved his life that day, along with the lives of many other Marines. And he said whenever he thinks about Anthony's struggle, it brings him to tears. So, um, And so Cavarelli's story, it's really interesting, I'll, and I'll get into this, but uh, he told a reporter in 1980 what he remembers about that day, and he said... When we got to the top of the ridge, all hell broke loose. Uh, one machine gun emplacement was taking the brunt of the attack, and the gunner was killed. The corporal in charge was killed, and I was wounded in the leg. He went on to then explain that he was trying to get to the machine gun, but he was struggling because of his gunshot wound. And then Anthony came forward, and I guess Anthony was just covered in blood. Um, but he still went ahead, and Anthony jumped on the machine gun. And Cavarelli said that Anthony ordered him back he ordered him to get back and told him to go get medical attention and send for help. And Cavarelli said, <laughs> I think he like started to leave, but then kind of realized it was just Anthony. And so Cavarelli said he came back to, and to help Anthony, but Anthony told him to just, just leave and go get help because Anthony apparently, apparently told him like, I'm done for anyway. So just go, go save yourself. Cause like I said earlier, Anthony had that shot to his throat and he thought it was a fatal wound. So it's kind of, kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and so Cavarelli, he ended the interview by saying, the guy did more than you'd expect from anybody. He didn't have to take over my gun. If it wasn't for him, they could have come right over the top of the ridge and the rest of the battalion was down below. It would have been like a turkey shoot. Because remember how Anthony was saying earlier, like on each side there were other companies, yeah. battalions or companies. Yeah. yeah. So, and so the other Marine that was able to testify on Anthony's behalf was Vincent Tortorici. And during the battle, Vincent, he was dazed and thrown 30 feet by a mortar shell. And in his testimony, he said, 
I know if there had been an officer in the immediate vicinity at the time to witness, as I did, his great act of heroism, he certainly would have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. I sincerely believe he is one of our great unsung heroes. And so they told their story to the Navy and a Navy board, which was reviewing the case and recommended that he receive the Medal of Honor. And so I know like Anthony was in the Marines, but the Navy is like over the Marines, right? Or a part of them? So the Marines is just a department of the Navy. Okay. They're, they're, they're their own branch, but there's some things that... The, the Marines, as far as the main branches, is one of the smallest. Okay. Right? Yeah. So especially if you're talking about, like, Army, Marines, Air Force, and Navy. The yeah. Marines are the smallest out of all those. Okay. So uh, the Marines are part of... They're a department of the Navy, although we are still our own entity. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Some people get that confused, but things like especially when it comes to like administrative stuff, the Marines don't don't have their own lawyers and things like that. And they're, you know, so like the all these things like the, all this stuff here with with the the lawsuit and all that. That's not surprising that that went through the Navy. It's so. kind of handled through the Navy. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for helping me clarify that because oh yeah, it talks a lot about the Navy in here, and I didn't want people to get confused between Navy and Marines. Right. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, we're still. A department of the Navy, so... Yeah. Yep, we still fall under their purview for for things of this type of nature Like you here, said, administrative so. stuff, so... But, yeah. Yeah. But we have our own commanding officer. We have the Commandant of the Marine Corps, you know, okay. so... Uh, but, you know, the Marines, for the most part, you know, we're... That's why we're known to be first to fight. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't... We don't have a huge amount of people in the Marines compared to other branches because that's the main purpose... We're, we're a fighting branch. Yeah. You know, um, so whereas in other Marines. branches, you'll see a lot more like supporting roles, things of that nature, uh, a lot more administrative type roles because they're a bigger organization. Yeah. So, so we kind of, I guess you could say we kind of borrow some of that from the Navy. That works. Which yeah. is good. So well, that makes sense. Yep. Send in the Marines. Yep. <laughs> but the one thing that is true is the Marines is the men's department. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yep. <laughs> yep. Maybe you guys hate to hear it, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so so the Navy board was reviewing it and kind of basing it off of this eyewitness testimony. And then the lawyers stepped in. <laughs> and so the Navy lawyers came in and said that he was still ineligible, even with the testimony, because there was some rule that said within that said recommendations for the Medal of Honor needed to be done within five years of the event. So that means this recommendation would have had to come into the Navy by 1947 in order for Anthony to be recommended for the Medal of Honor. Yeah, ridiculous. Just some technicality that some pencil pusher is coming up with. Exactly. And that's the thing. I I don't like politics and... uh, um, Hopefully after this, they actually rewrote that policy or whatever that rule is. Yeah. Well, and it's frustrating too because, you know, you think like this incident happened in 1942. We were still in the middle of World War II. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff, you know, these men are still fighting or recovering in a hospital somewhere. Like yeah, exactly. five years is nothing. Well, I don't know if you, you're going to, I think you're going to get into it here, but it, I mean, it took him like almost four years just to learn how to walk again. Exactly. So I think he had more important things on his mind. Yeah. Than, and, and it's funny because, you know, it's probably some stupid regulation or something. Some, somebody wrote a long time ago, Yeah. you know, why, why is there, it doesn't even make any sense. Why do you even have that? Why five years? Exactly. Why not 10 years? You know what yeah. I mean? As long as there's evidence solid evidence supporting it there shouldn't be any type of time frame on it i completely agree so, it's a really stupid it's role. idiotic well so. and then you know the two men who like were his eyewitnesses one was sent to a hospital in australia yeah and uh, the other one was sent to the hospital uh in oakland with him and so i mean they were still recovering themselves sure. <laughs> so yeah um but one of the navy board members who recommended uh, Anthony for the Medal of Honor said, if this man isn't a hero, then I don't know who is. And so I think a lot of people were pushing for it, but, you know, like you said, some people got hung up on one stupid little policy. <laughs> yeah, and then also it kind of goes back to uh, the enemy combatant from the Japanese. You know, you said you found that in the Boston Herald. Yeah. So um, 
I'd be curious to know all the details on that. I know. I mean, what 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 more do you want, man? You th- you think that because you know these lawyers are always looking for little angles and exactly. things of that nature. They're doing their job, but at the same time, if you have an enemy combatant taking his time mm-hmm. after all these years to be like, yeah. I was there that day, and this was no joke. Yeah. I mean, come on. This guy deserves an honor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the other thing, too, is if Anthony would get the, would have got the Medal of Honor, and spoiler alert, he eventually does, which is a good thing, um, it added another $100 a month to his pension. Yeah. However, he had to wait so long to get that, um, which would have helped him throughout those years of raising his family. He had to fight for his life that day, and then he had to fight off these lawyers later in his life just to... Get the Medal of Honor and the compensation. I mean, exactly. He was, dis- he was disabled for the rest of his life. The rest of his life. Three guys out of 30 survived this thing. Yep. So. And the other two basically said, like, we wouldn't have survived if it wasn't for Anthony. Yeah. So, so. three out of 30. So 90% yeah. died that day. It's so sad. It's insane. Yeah, kind of sad, too, that he has to fight. Just for this right here. Oh, I know. You and know. just wait till you see all, everything. He proved that... himself enough that day. He shouldn't have had to go through this no. crap. So Mm-mm, I agree. Especially when the eyewitnesses come forward. Yeah. At that point, it should have been, uh, okay, yep, that's it. Let's give it to him. Yeah. You deserve it. And then even after they had it, well, you missed the five years. Uh, yeah. It's like, exactly. it's like, sorry, we were still in the middle of World War II for <laughs> another three years. Um, And so... It kind of went, you know, it kind of go back and forth. And then a second board looked at the case and after review recommended that Anthony be given the Navy Cross Medal, which is the Navy and the Marine Corps' second highest honor. But Anthony, he turned this down and he said it's a matter of principle at this point. And he told a reporter that he also refused it because he was never told why he was initially turned down for the Medal of Honor. And so he told the reporter, quote, I believe in democracy. Every man is entitled to know from the government the circumstances of his case, especially in a decision that was very important to me. You know, he had a lot of his officers backing him up too. And they told him, like, don't don't accept that. You deserve the Medal of Honor. And then it comes with that additional pension for That's him. That's what Marines do. Yep. We're brothers, man. We, we, we back each other up. I'm glad that he didn't sway. Me too. You know, especially for something this important. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, he, this guy literally put his life on the line. Yep. Uh, was lucky that he even survived. Oh, for sure. In fact, so he ended up actually suing the government in 1966 under the Freedom of Information Act. And then he was able to get the minutes from the first Navy board meeting. And that's apparently how he found out that he was denied for the, why he was denied for the Medal of Honor. He said it basically boiled down to the government not wanting to set a president that they would be willing to give medals of honor out years after a battle or an incident happened. But like you and I just talked about, who cares? Yeah. If somebody heroically sacrifices themselves or, you know, does what Anthony did, who cares how many years later it is? Just give them the medal of honor. Yeah, I mean, that's like one of just those, like we said, it's just some type of arbitrary rule that somebody yeah. come up with. Why Why five years? Why not ten years? Why, yeah. why is there even a time limit to begin exactly. with? Exactly. There should not be a time limit. Okay, like crazy shit happens in wars. It does. Okay, it's not like you have time to be like, oh, okay, let me uh, analyze this while I have yeah. hand grenades being thrown at me. <laughs> exactly. Got a bullet wound in my neck. Yeah. Uh, so it's messy. It's nasty. That's why it's called war, people. Yeah. Okay? And there should be no time limit on that. Sometimes it takes a while for the truth to come out. Well, and like so, we said earlier, 1942, World War II didn't end until 1945. There was three more years of war. Yeah. Like, that's not their top priority at that point is not going through all of that. It's getting through the war, healing their bodies. Anthony was in rehabilitation forever. I mean... Yeah. It, th- that's why there should not be a timeline on something like that. That's ridiculous. I completely agree. There should be no timeline as long as uh, there's um, factual evidence supporting yep. uh, the accounts of what, what actually took place. Yeah. Because you could have things like, like that that enemy combatant come up years later. I mean, yeah. he's in Japan, okay? They Probably at that point in time, what, here in the late 40s, 50s, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like we... Things are nowadays where you have the internet and you have yes. instant. They're not. They don't know all the accounts or things that are taking place in the no. U.S. So it would have been really interesting to even know how that that 
Japanese soldier even found out about it and, yeah. and gave his account of it as well. I was actually so, wondering that. I was wondering if he, you know, immigrated to America or if he maybe just read it in like a big paper, like the Boston Herald is a big paper, the New York Times, something like that. And then, yeah. and then came forward and it would be really interesting. I could find, I could find Cavarelli and Vincent's testimony, but I couldn't find anything on the Japanese. Yeah. Officers. Another thing that's funny, I find funny is these men are good enough to send over and have them die for your country. But when they give you their word of what happened, their word's not good enough. I know. That's pretty That's pretty sad, isn't it? It is. It's very sad. I mean, these when... guys were three guys that survived out of 30 that were slaughtered that day. Yeah. I know. And when those two came forward and testified and corroborated Anthony's story, that should have been good enough. He should have yeah. had the Medal of Honor right then and there. It's integrity, man. Yeah. These are Marines, man. They're, they, that was one of the main things that they taught us when I was in the Marines is integrity. Yeah. Exactly. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing. Doing the right thing when nobody's looking. I'm glad that, that his his uh, uh, fellow Marines and uh, other supporters that were in the military kept on telling him not to yeah. to give in. Because that mean that first they didn't want to give him anything. And then they're like, okay, well, we'll give you the second best. How about the Navy the Cross? Second best. It's just like, where are you guys even coming up with this crap? Exactly. You know? And so, you know, Anthony wasn't a boaster like he didn't tell people about what he did because he married olivia in 1954 and she didn't know she knew he was in the military she knew he served in world war ii she knew he was wounded really badly but she didn't know the specifics about that and for 13 years and then once he kind of started pursuing this a reporter came to the door and he told his story to the reporter and that was the first time she had heard the full story so he was not one to go out it wasn't I guess what I'm trying to say is it wasn't like he was outgoing. I deserve the Medal of Honor. I deserve, you know, he wasn't boasting and like trying to be that type of a person. Does that make sense? I don't know. Oh, of course it does. But he didn't even tell his wife for 13 years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is traumatic. This is very traumatic stuff. It's not easy to talk about either. No. So that's another reason why the whole five years is just idiotic. Exactly. I mean, obviously the guy almost died and. Back then, they didn't know about PTSD. No. Right? So he's probably got, uh, you know, they they probably, back then they just called it shell shock. Yeah. You know, or they had some other generic terms for it. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, we're talking about the 40s and the 50s. Exactly. Right? So, um, especially mental health care wasn't good back then. Yeah. I mean, even, like, this is World War II. I mean, they had tons of trouble with this even later on. Yeah. During the Vietnam era. Yeah. And actually, we're still having a lot of trouble with it nowadays. Oh, for here. sure. And basically, we're about in 2024. Mental health is not an easy thing to approach. No. And, yeah, so I think I've made myself completely clear. Um, yeah. I hopefully, um, maybe after this, we'll have to research to see whatever stupid Navy jag law that was about the five years yeah. or whatever. Uh, they had to have changed it after that. I hope they did. Uh, hopefully they did. Because, I'll look into it and see. Yeah. Um, if they if they've updated that and hopefully they just got rid of the years completely. There shouldn't be a timeline on something like that. I don't think there should be. Not at uh. all. Because like you said, it's not an easy thing for Marines, soldiers, etc., to talk about after the war, anyways. And then yeah. it's just it's just ridiculous. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Shouldn't be a timeline. <laughs> nope. No timeline. Um, and so in 1978, Anthony and his wife, Olivia, along with other supporters, they really started going after it and really made a point to get this done. And so they started picketing and protesting at the White House and they would go out and protest basically against the governmental red tape that stood in his way. Uh, and they, they went out for 54 days straight in front of the White House and, uh, picketed and protested and um, Anthony, you know, he would have to go out there in his wheelchair because at this point he could walk, but not without the support of a cane. And so he would be out there in his wheelchairs. And um, this is the one, one of these things where I'm like, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so one of Anthony's signs that he would carry said, alone on Guadalcanal and alone here. Yeah. <sighs> that one, that yeah, one gets me. For sure. I mean, it's horrible that a veteran of his caliber who definitely deserved the Medal of Honor. Yeah. And was able to hold that position. 
See, the thing is, too, is is they're not taking into account all the lives he saved that day. Yeah. Okay, if, if the Japanese would have actually overrun that position, then they could have went down and attacked the other company's positions. Exactly. So he saved numerous lives through his bravery. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, it's just it's just really sad. That's all I gotta say. But it's it's part of our country. Um, it's part of politics. It is the you know the red tape like they have, mm-hmm. and then bu- the bureaucracy of things is just absolutely ridiculous. It is. You know? And hopefully, but, I mean, I I mean, obviously, I understand the politics of things. Sure. I was in the Marines myself, so yep. um, you know, and I served out in Iraq. Uh, you know, not during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Yeah. You know, nothing like what this guy did, of course. You know sure, what I mean? This but... is this is uh this is just an insane position to be put in. Yeah. He was completely overrun and he kept on going. It takes a lot to do that. You know, I mean, because when you're out there and, and things are going down, sometimes things just happen. You know, yeah. like it's like I was saying earlier, it's fight or flight. You know what I mean? It's exactly. Scary situation. I 100% believe he deserved the Medal of Honor. And the fact that he had to fight this long, get out there in a wheelchair in front of the White House. Because at this point we're 1978. Yeah. And so. Jesus, 1978? And he's, he's an old man by this time. Yep. You know? And so 1978 and that battle. Happened in 1942, so 36 years later, and he's picketing. And spoiler alert again, he won't get the Medal of Honor for another two more years. <laughs> but this is where in 1978 it really started picking up, um, because he had all of his supporters. He had like the Sons of Italy behind him, the American Legion behind him, um, and I'll get into some a few other people that came out and supported him. But in 1978, it really picked up and had to go through Congress and all of that kind of stuff too get it approved by president carter but so 38 years basically uh even anthony and olivia's four daughters they were out there and they ranged from ages 12 to 24 and their daughter mary was quoted saying everyone in school knows his story he's taught me to fight for what i believe in so even at that point in the 70s everybody knew his story i mean history was taught and he was a part of it and so anthony he later told a reporter that there were times he he almost felt embarrassed picketing in front of the White House, but he knew that he was fighting for a principle. And he said, quote, I felt there was a principle more important than my embarrassment. Because like I said earlier, he wasn't out there boasting and looking for like attention. He just like, it was the principle of the matter. And Olivia, (laughs) she actually spent a lot of time picketing. She spent so much time out there that by the time the 54 days were over, she had lost 22 pounds. Wow. I know. And in fact, one day while she was picketing, she actually ended up passing out. <laughs> I just don't think she was eating enough or taking enough breaks. Um, and, you know, it was easier for her to, to get out and walk back and forth. And she was a huge advocate for him. She really went to bat for him. Yeah. And so, um, like I said earlier, he had support from the Sons of Italy, the American Legion, and numerous congressmen. And at this point, a Hollywood producer, Louis Kerner, he came forward to support Anthony as well. He you know, saw Anthony's fight in the newspapers and on the news. And he said, quote, Casamento needed an army of people behind him to help. And Lewis, he actually served in World War II as well. He served as a special services officer in the army, uh, in the army air corps and also entertained the troops. And so he actually began his entertainment career as a vaudeville performer, which is another throwback to Clevio. Yeah. So if you guys haven't seen that episode, you should check out the uh, the Strongman episode we yep. did on Clevio. So. Clevio Massimo, the Italian Hercules. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then Lewis, he moved into producing and he produced a few movies and TV shows like Superman. So That's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And after hearing about Anthony and Olivia picketing outside the White House, he decided that the couple needed a break and flew them out to California for a rest slash mini vacation. Nice. So, but Lewis also had to meet with an attorney out there to discuss the situation. And this really paid off because on August 22nd, 1980, President Carter approved awarding, awarding Anthony with the Medal of Honor. Nice. So that finally got approved <laughs> 38 years later. <laughs> wow. It took him three decades. I know. A huge amount of petitions, appeals. 
Good Lord. Filing to get the paperwork on the meetings. Man. And we know the government can move really slow. <laughs> well, he set a good example for his, his kids. He did. You know, he was a, a fighter throughout his whole life. Yep. Um, on the battlefield and in his life later. Exactly. Fighting for what was right and yep. the principles. And he didn't back down. He didn't. He didn't back so, down. He kept going. So. Yep. Um, and then on September 13th, 1980, at the... In the Rose Garden at the White House, President Carter awarded the Medal of Honor to Anthony. Um, and Anthony, like I said, who needed a cane to walk, he was actually escorted into the Rose Garden by the First Lady. <laughs> so, um, and the fact that he was flown into D.C. on a government airplane and was escorted by the Marines. That's so, awesome. Yeah. And so, um, President Carter, he pinned the medal on Anthony and said, The deed Anthony Casamento performed is the kind that makes legends. He went beyond the struggle of most men to survive. He went beyond the call of duty. And so, um, no tears. <laughs> mm. And so Anthony, during this time, he hung his head and cried during the ceremony. But when the national anthem was held high, or when the national anthem was sung, he held his head high. And then Olivia, she was crying quietly at his side. Mm. And there's some really cool pictures that I'll post on the Instagram, like, Olivia, she's giving him this huge hug. <laughs> and then, um, like, you know, there's a couple of points where you can tell he's crying. And phew, I'm going to try not to cry right here. Uh, and then, like, shaking President Carter's hand. And so there's some really cool photos that I'll post. So That's amazing. But, yeah. Um, like I said, his wife, she she truly loved him and went to bat for him a lot. She did. Yeah. But, um. And so then in 1980, after, you know, after the ceremony was over, a reporter with the Daily News in New York came over to his house and uh, he showed her the medal and told his story. And he actually had the medal resting on a case on top of his TV. <laughs> and he said that it was just easier to keep it there because, you know, when people would come over, they always wanted to see it. And so, and I'm sure, you know, he liked watching like the nightly news and seeing his medal on top of his TV. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing when he gave this interview with the Daily News, um, he really emphasized to the reporter that he loved the Marine Corps and he didn't want this whole situation to reflect badly on the Marines. So yeah, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard for people to understand who have never served. Sure. Yeah. Right. So we have a lot of crazy things that happen in this world. You have to have brave men and women who are willing to go out there. Yeah. And defend what they believe in. Yeah. And so, you know, we haven't. Uh, implemented the draft since World War Two. Yeah. Right? Or was it in Vietnam? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I misspoke. Yeah. Vietnam, Vietnam was the last time. Yeah. I don't believe they... No, yeah. Vietnam was the last time they implemented so the draft. Too. Yeah. Because yeah, my dad just barely missed that. Okay. So, but still, that's quite a long time. It is. Because, so, I guess the point I was trying to make with that is this is a volunteer yeah. service. These people are volunteering to go do these things. Yep. Yeah. Which is good. I think it's good. You want those people who really want to do it. Exactly. That makes for better uh, military service members. Sure. That makes sense. So, um, yeah, this is it's just a great story. It is. And it makes sense. He put it on his TV. <laughs> I know. I thought Because was everybody was wanting to look at it anyway. He's <laughs> like, ah, I, I don't want to have to go dig this out again. Exactly. He's put it up here. So. <laughs> yep. And you know he loved looking at it too. It oh, yeah. Him. So happy. Um, and you know, he's just loyal to the Marines to the end too. He really wanted to emphasize like, I don't want this whole situation to reflect bad on, on the Marine Corps. So, yeah. And so on May 2nd, 1987, so this is like what, seven years after he got the Medal of Honor, Anthony and Olivia, they renewed their wedding vows and they had already been married 35 years at this point. Um, and they had actually originally planned to renew their vows on their anniversary, which was in August of that year. But Anthony told her he didn't think he would make it to August. And so Anthony knew he was near death and he just wanted to show Olivia how much he loved her. And so he was suffering from cancer at this point. Mm. Um, and so he had, he was spending a lot of time at the VA hospital and had hospice and everything was involved. So they went ahead and did that in May. And during the ceremony, Olivia told a reporter that Anthony, he was wearing a $33 suit that he had bought years ago, but he just loved the suit so much. That's he, awesome. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to wear it. Um, and she also said that getting married in a church was one of Anthony's 
last wishes. And so it was really cool that they were able to do that. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, and Anthony told the reporter that Olivia was one in a million. <laughs> and their daughter, Anne, she was um, their photographer. And they were surrounded by numerous family and friends that day. So, uh, And actually, they renewed their vows at the North Point VA Medical Center uh, on Long Island. And they, they did it at the military chapel there. So, um, And sadly, Anthony, he did pass away that year before August. So he passed away on July 18th, 1987 from lymphoma cancer. And he was 66. So, And he passed away at North Point VA Medical Center. Um, in his casket, it was draped with a flag and carried by six Marines. And I'll post a picture of it on Instagram because nice. it's really cool. Try yeah, I'd like to take a look at that. Up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh. such a baby. I can cry at almost anything. <laughs> I'm like, deep breaths. <laughs> well, it makes sense on something like this, though. It does. You know? Yeah, especially with you being a Marine. and Yeah. yeah and I love our, I love our armed forces. So. Yeah, exactly. You know, got to support, support your armed forces. And remember, we're out there fighting the fight because it needs to be done. We're not out there because we want to fight. Exactly. And so uh, that's what happens with our, our leaders. That's what happens between politicians. Exactly. The ones in power are the ones who start the wars and the yeah. battles. But then there's somebody who actually has to, to brave the storm and yeah. that's what this guy did. I'm glad he never gave up. Me too. That That's just a great story. I'm glad uh, he got it before his death. Oh, yeah. I mean, that would have been terrible if they honored him after his death. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. sure, being honored is being honored, but he needed yeah. to see it in life. Yeah, no, it didn't, so. it didn't happen that way. And, you know, he, he fought for it. He did. So he fought for it. He was definitely a fighter, so... Um, but he was actually recognized after death um, because on June 23rd, 1991, which was five years later, Anthony was once again recognized for his service in the town of West Islip. They put up a permanent memorial in the town park for Anthony, and they actually ended up naming the park after him. So it's the Anthony Casamento Park. That's cool. Um, and now... That's somewhere in New York? Or? Uh, Long Island. Oh, Long Island. Yeah. Okay. And so what I... Can, gather from the pictures online now these pictures were from 2007 it looks like a lot of his medals and stuff are on display behind a case there um and so it's really cool because there's like his medals pictures of him and olivia his parents and so it's really neat and then him and his daughter mary and so i don't know if it's still there but it 2007 it was there yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty cool um and the dedication it was actually led by his daughter mary and she also sang the national anthem at this time and during the dedication they also had a rifle salute and bagpipes playing amazing grace that's so, awesome that's a cool nice nice memorial for him yeah. and his family to be able to have that too for sure so, yeah he's had four kids right four daughters yep yeah, all daughters so, yeah <laughs> you know they love their papa oh for sure so, they definitely did yeah um and so rocker rocco castoro he was a member of the italian american war veteran society and they raised about five thousand for the memorial so that's awesome yeah and it's it's a cool memorial it's a pretty stone it has like different streaks of color and then it has a plaque dedicated to him that's awesome. So, and there's even like a street that's named after him and then the park. So, um, but yeah, so that's it for today's story. And what a, what a great story, story, especially with Veterans Day right around the corner. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, these are stories which, uh, like I, I, in, like I said, I had, I had, uh, we had learned about this story when I was in the Marines, but they didn't go into all the details like sure. you did. You know, you got a lot, a lot of, extra details on his family yeah and, you know they probably uh, just talked about the battle yeah primarily. it was mainly mainly about the battle and yeah. things like that so uh we didn't i didn't know about all this struggle he had yeah but you know what they probably should add that in the marine corps history they should because uh this guy was a fighter throughout his whole life yeah and uh they were different battles yeah they were different battles he was fighting exactly and but, he truly uh, loved the marines yeah because even after all of that he still yeah wanted them to be honored yep so yeah i mean he was disabled for the rest of his life he could have been you know in in, in for anybody that has happened to there's nothing to say that that's wrong either right yeah. everybody is you know people who get disabled and you know they're sour about the military after that. Sure. 
can't say anything bad. I mean, that's that's the way they feel too. Exactly, and it's understandable. So, yeah, you know? I mean, you can... until you're in their in your their shoes, then exactly, there's nothing you can say. Nothing so, you can say. Yeah. Um, the most important thing is is that they served. So, yeah. Exactly. Regardless. So, yeah. And as yeah. long as they can be taken care of. Yeah. So. But yeah, what an amazing guy. And I, he really was. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of our brave veterans out there. And thank you, Jerry, for your service and for doing this podcast with me. Heck yeah. <laughs> and I just want to say Semper Fi to my other Marine brothers out there. Hope you all have a wonderful Veterans Day. Nice. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed listening to the story of Anthony Casamento. And I hope you come back to listen to more stories about Italian Americans. See you next time. See you later.